Hey guys, Podcast 7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, March 21st, 2019, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, today for you guys, I got a video on the long skulls found at uh, Mesa Verde, Colorado, um, at the cliff dwellings there which I'm sure many people are familiar with, okay? Here's some pictures of it, just, you know, incredible, beautiful sight, okay? I'm sure you know about them, you heard about them, okay? And this is about the early archaeology done there, because here's a picture of it in the winter time, snow all over the place, just beautiful. Amazing place, but I think what a lot I think mainstream um, academics have this whole story wrong, and because they're not taking into account a couple other things. For instance, what went on at Galena, for example, and you know I show that in uh, my video from Saram's book. Um, The, ta the Towers of Silence, okay, about the Galena people, all right, and the work that Frank C. Hibben did there. And also on Lovelock Cave, I did a video on Lovelock Cave too, all right. But people of a different phenotype, people of a different morphology and a different phenotype, of occupying these areas of the Southwest. And I think all of these sites, even Hovenweed, for example, which I think they have the story all wrong, you know, with Hovenweed. All right. And this site is almost identical to Galena, yet Galena is not a national monument. There's 500 towers there Okay, as reported by the first rancher to see him, he said they were 25 to 30 foot high, although all the pictures I've ever seen of Galena shows the towers in, in shambles, in ruins, as if they were vandalized or, you know, I don't know. I have a theory that, you know, they may have been used for target practice by the military because they were, it was a discounted site. And they haven't got back there, it's, it's at, you know, until 2007, and we haven't heard anything since. Of people of a different phenotype, a different of morphology. So I just want to read you this chapter, again, from C.W. Saran's book. I've done another video on it, Elongated Skulls USA. But I want to read this short chapter to you and just show you that, you know, Brian Forster is not the first one to come across elongated, naturally occurring elongated skulls. They were found here in the late 1800s at Mesa Verde, here, okay? And, you know, that's what the real story is. And Saram is bringing us these stories of little-known amateur archaeologists and you know people who are not counted you know in mainstream so much you know and just a footnote here and there but these people are responsible for major finds in um, archaeology and here's just what uh, wikipedia says you know about this is the the chapter i'm going to read from cw saram's book the first american okay it's going to be about this guy, Richard Weatherill, not Weatherhill, as I had said before, but I just wanted to get it straight here, what this is all about, okay? Let me just read to you, and, you know, Wikipedia doesn't include the stuff that Saram goes over in here for whatever reasons. They give him credit here, but, you know, they don't tell you what it's all about, okay? Just a brief thing here, and uh, nothing uh, specifically, but even some mischaracterizations as well, okay? Richard Weatherhill, a member of a prominent Colorado ranching family, was an amateur explorer in discovery, research, and excavation of sites associated with the ancient Pueblo people, okay? We're not necessarily talking about ancient Pueblo people, but, you know, we'll, 
We'll talk about that. He is credited with the discovery of Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde and was responsible for initially selecting the term Anasazi. So he's responsible for it. As this article says, and it says Navajo for ancient enemy, right? Navajo for ancient enemy, right? But in Saram's book written in 1971, you can see here, all right? They were calling the Anasazi the quote-unquote old ones, not ancient enemy, old ones. So something changed between 71 and now for them to do this or whatever. And maybe it was their enemy. Maybe it was these people of a different morphology. As Frank C. Hibbins' work showed at Galena, these people were of a different morphology. They were different shape, different bone structure. Okay? Which they don't want to approach for whatever reasons. And I think Holy Wheat is another site where these people were, although the Pueblos must have cleaned them out and occupied these ruins here. And Lovelock Cave was just the last vestiges of these people who were living in it. They called the Lovelock people or whatever, a different, another people that the, even the museum says are slightly more robust, which is a euphemism for they were bigger, okay, euphemistically speaking. All right, okay, and I think all of this is related, Hovenweed, Galena, and Mesa Verde. So let me read to you from this chapter in, in C.W. Saram's book, okay, The First American. Again, back to this, okay, like I said, I did a video of this, but I don't think it was adequate enough, and I didn't get to the bottom of it. I didn't explain everything correctly. So let me just read to you. It's a very short chapter, and Saram makes note of some very interesting things. It's an interesting story, nevertheless, okay, about this guy, Frank um, Weatherhill, Richard Weatherhill. One hot, in chapter 11 from uh, Saram's book, The First American, The Inquisitive Brothers of Mesa Verde. One hot afternoon, two men were riding a trot through the parched southwestern landscape of Chaco Canyon. Farmer Richard Weatherill and his cowhand, Bill Finn, were out looking for some clue who had killed their favorite horse at Weatherill's daughter, of Weatherhill's daughter, Elizabeth. As they approached a the riverbed, they encountered a group of Navajo Indians, several of them armed. What happened next was never fully clarified, not even in subsequent judicial investigation held under unusual circumstances. According to Finn's testimony, Kiss Killing Begay, a Navajo with whom they were acquainted, approached them and struck up a conversation. They parted. The sun was blinding. No one could see clearly. A shot was fired and passed over Finn's head. Another shot struck Weatherhill's raised hand, which was holding the reins, and passed through his chest. He tumbled from his horse, killed instantly. Such incidents were not unusual in 1910. We would have, have no reason to tell the story if Richard Weatherhill had not been one of the most picturesque personalities in the Navajo country, perhaps the last of his kind, <clears throat> and surely the most exceptional amateur archaeologist who ever lived in the Southwest, okay, Saram says. Weatherill, too, suffered the lot of every great amateur in science, reluctantly acknowledged by the professionals. He was at the same time always being slandered as a pot hunter, as a Navajo trader who had enriched himself at the expense of the Indians, as a cattle thief who was hailed, called, proofreader error, into court four times as for his quote-unquote enrichment. After he died, his widow found $73.23 in his bank account, along with IOUs amounting to several thousand dollars from the Navajos. We are indebted to Frank McMitt, the editor of a small Massachusetts newspaper, who with zeal bordering on fanaticism undertook many journeys to the southwest to collect all available facts about Richard Weatherill and restore the honor of his name. Thanks to McNitt's book, Richard Weatherill, Anasazi, its documentation is absolutely convincing. We now know how great a part this farmer and his brothers played in the archaeology of the southwest. Okay, and here's a 
unusual decoration on a bowl from Mesa Verde, Colorado. Most of Mesa Verde's people's decoration was slight, was strictly geometric. Okay. So going quite back in time, but who knows where they got this from, you know, originally. There were five brothers, Richard, Benjamin, John, Clayton, and Winslow. This is not the place to sketch the pioneering life of these five Quakers. We are interested primarily in the discovery of Mesa Verde. Of course, these men were amateurs, but they were not untutored. They made drawings, took photographs, pushed into the wildest country, clambered into the most inaccessible canyons, and provided the first dependable accounts of the basket makers, the oldest Pueblo ancestors, according to mainstream, and the cliff dwellings of Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde is, as the name indicates, a great plateau covered with lush vegetation about 15 by 20 miles in area. It rises to a height of 2,000 feet above the surrounding country in the southwest corner of Colorado, which is not far from Hovenly, okay, and Galena. Love Lock Cave in Nevada. I mean, this is all in the general area of these places, okay? All right. All right. Thus, they seem to be falling into a kind of boastful patriotism and exaggerating what can be seen in Mesa Verde. I shall quote the account of a witness whose motives cannot be suspected. Once again, the British archaeologist Jaquetta Hawks, whose eyes have been schooled by all the wonders of the old world. After she first climbed the steep road to Mesa Verde, she wrote, quote, We drove along through the low woods at the stately pace prescribed by the regulation. All seemed quiet and monotonous, the level plateau unbroken. With the suddenness of utmost light, it was there before us. We were at the edge of a deep canyon. The th earth had opened up before us. The upper parts were vertical walls of sandstone, banded buff and brown. Lower down, these broke into steep slopes, dark with vegetation. This naturally natural grandeur so suddenly revealed was marvelous enough, but there opposite to us on the far side of the canyon was, it, was a hanging city. Okay? The hanging city of Mesa Verde. The little pale gold city of towers and climbing houses filled a vast oval hollow in the rock. The dark points of the pines rose up to its foot. The immense black shadow of the cave roofed it with a single span. But the fronts of the houses and towers were in bright sunlight, all their angles revealed and the doors and windows showing as jet black squares. It was like an intaglio sharp cut in an oval bezel. The limestone rose sheer above it to meet the forest and then the unbounded blue. It looked so infinitely remote there across the gulf, so remote and serene in its rock setting that it seemed like some dream or a mirage of an, inter of an in eternal city." Unquote. Mesa Verde must have had a similar striking effect to those who first saw the ruins. The first was probably Captain J.N. McComb in 1859, although a certain father, Francisco Antonazio, pitched camp in the vicinity as early as 1776. Okay, so in any case, I think that, you know, you can see these things weren't even looked at until later on, 1776, 1859, that's a long time. And as I said, I certainly suspect that somehow Galena got wrecked, whereas they found these towers there at Galena that were 25 and 30 foot high. Now you can't seem to see, there's no pictures of any of them of that height. They all seem to be ruined for some reason. I kind of wonder how that happened. Okay, Hoven we no, not so much, but this ruin still there, almost complete stuff there. And the site seems just so similar. Just so incredibly similar. It just, the story's not correct there, I believe it's not. Okay.
On a cool December morning in 1888, Richard Wetherill appeared upon the scene. With his cousin Charlie Mason, he was looking for the lost cattle. In point of fact, these were not his first ruins. He had discovered others in the vicinity of his father's farm considerably earlier. One night in 1885, an enterprising young lady had spent the night at the farm, a Miss Virginia Donahue, who ignored all injunctions to return home as quickly as possible and instead went hunting arrowheads and pottery with the Wetherill brothers. She paid a second visit to their farm the following year, and on October 6, 1886, the brothers and the girl found their way to one of the most impressive ruins, the quote-unquote balcony house. But Richard and his cousin were alone when they made their most important discovery, what is now called the Cliff Palace, Mesa Verde. It is the largest of all cave, quote-unquote, towns, with 200 dwelling rooms and 23 chivas. On December 18th, 1888, they found a spruce tree ruin, and the following day, the square tower ruin. So, another one of these square towers, you know, they find, you know, like they find down there in Peru, with those funerary towers, the square towers at Galena, the square towers at Hovenweep, okay? You just, you know, you gotta think about this stuff, guys. Right? The apparently pre Columbian tribe that lived here was called Anasazi, and the Indians dubbed Richard with the honorable nickname of Anasazi. Now, why would they give him the nickname if it's ancient enemy? Or maybe this guy was an enemy. Who knows? You know, this is where the story is muddled up. And like I said, there's a relationship to Hoven Weep here, Galena, Lovelock Cave, because all because of the morphology of these people, the phenotype of these people are different. And so they go into it. Okay? Here. They became, in, in, uh, the weather rules continued to explore the region on their own and put their knowledge at the disposal of others. They became the indispensable guides to everyone who came to the region and showed a serious interest in ruins. When in 1893, the Swedish archaeologist Gustav Nordenskjold published a preliminary scientific account, The Cliff Dwellers of Mesa Verde, he owed much of his information to those remarkable brothers above all Richards. Okay? Today we know that history of Mesa Verde began around A.D. 500 and that, like the history of so many other pueblos and cliff dwellings in this area, it had come to the end by A.D. 1300. Like the ones in Hovenweep, Galena, and even the Lovelock Cave, all taking place within relative time periods, okay, they say. Okay, but I don't think they have the story straight. There's the cliff palaces, there's the, you know, topographical view of the architectural designs of the buildings and kivas there okay very very cool okay the distances richard covered on foot and horseback must have been enormous through the meet through meetings and friendships with scientists his expertise increased he seems to have been the first to, to postulate the existence of a tribe Okay, that lived in the region before the Pueblo and cliff dwelling peoples. Okay, so this is a third peoples. Okay, and it was he who called this quote unquote pre ceramic people basket makers. Okay, so the earliest people here, the name by which they are still known, although archaeologists and others sometimes speak more generally of Anasazi, quote unquote. So they're jumbling it up, okay? Here's where the problems sort of arise with trying to pinpoint out who these people were. Maybe they were the ancient enemies, as they say, of these people who did, that they killed the Galena because Frank C. Hibbins' work showed, okay, that the people at Galena, the, the weapons that were used there on those people, all right, were, seemed to be a Pueblo um, making the style of them, etc., although it could have been somebody else, but that's what Frank C. Hibbins' work showed, all right? So, all right. 
His first detailed description of this people probably dates from 1894. The article is not signed with his name, but McNitt, his best biographer, has no doubt of its authorship. In his student days, Kidder was warned against, quote, Wetherill's invention of a people, unquote. Huh. So he was warned against that. You know, they warned him, don't say anything. Later, he brilliantly confirmed their reality by his own researches, okay? So then he researched it, and he found out what he was talking about was correct. In 1897, Mitchell Pruden, with Weather Ill's assistant, have published a report that should have banished all doubts. Here is one paragraph from Weather Ill's article who shows what a careful observer he was, okay? Quote, two feet below the lowest remains of the cliff dwellers, the people before the Pueblo, their, their ancestors, okay? We have found remains of quite a different tribe. Different tribe. This difference is determined by the shape of the head, which is natural, long-headed, or dolichocephalus. The cliff dwellers, as we find them, have a perpendicular flattening at the back of the head, making it artificially brachycephalous, okay? Similar to that of the people at Galena, as Frank C. Hibbin found, okay? Similar to that of Lovelock Cave, okay? So, I think they're, they don't have this story correct, folks. I think it's a bigger picture, a bigger story of a different kind of peoples with a different phenotype that were there at this time because the story seems so similar at all of these places and a bit dubious at others where there's so much missing, okay? And you have these, obviously, people who had natural long heads and people who were doing it artificially right after them, the cliff dwellers, to perhaps honor these people but we don't know because the story's all muddled up, okay? And elsewhere, like the Lena, Lovelock, Hogan Weep, okay? Snake Town, Arizona, where the Hohokam were, you know, all of these places. But somehow that's left out of this story because it's inexplicable. It would suggest a different story of the past, okay? We have taken 92, 92 skeletons, okay, of these long-headed people. Where are they? Can we see them? No. Where? Come on. At depths varying from four and a half to seven feet, so much below the cliff dwellers, two feet below the cliff dwellers and lower, okay, up to seven feet including three cliff dwellers lying at a depth from two or three feet. In the central portion of the cave, the skeletons were lying close enough to touch each other, so all buried in the center of the cave. Okay, of the, of the cave. Okay. <clears throat> First photographs of the ruins were brought to the east by William Henry Jackson starting in 1874. Jackson, a photographer of the West in its pioneering days, even made clay models of the cliff dwellings, which, okay, and here's the reconstruction, very similar to Hovenweep, very similar to Galena. So just keep that in mind, folks. I'm telling you, they don't have this story correct. The story's bigger. It involves Mesa Verde, Galena, Hoban Weep, and Lovelock Cave, all related to these people of a different phenotype, these people who were also artificially, um, you know, deformed their skulls as well. Okay, they talk about these people that were called barbarians, giants, whatever, these kind of things that people say about other people, all the monsters, like done in modern times, just socially, you know, done things, you know, sociology 101, as I said, the enemy figure for social cohesion, it's that way in every culture, it's just, that's the way it is, psychology of, of peoples, see, all right, doesn't matter who they are. All right, so this is the the photographs and ruins were brought to the east by William Henry Jackson in 1874. He, Jackson was the famous photographer, and he, and he created the stir at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. 
No one had ever before heard of such cave dwellings in North America. In fact, the models and photos created such a sensation that for a while they diverted visitors from the real attraction of the exhibition, Great Alexander Graham Bell's fantastic invention, the telephone. So, people were fascinated by this, okay? Not so much anymore, huh? Mesa Verde was declared a national park, and J.F. Fuchs undertook the initial archaeological organization of the site. Today, there is a permanent archaeological station there with an impressive museum. The necessary steps to protect the ruin have been taken, but only a few years ago, the public was alarmed to learn that this most beautiful of Indian quote-unquote cities was imperiled. Supersonic Air Force planes were flying over the cliff dwellings, producing cracks in the old buildings that have withstood all the trials of nature for centuries. In 1967, the government was forced to deal with the problem. The New York Times published detailed reports. There was, for example, the testimony of Navajo named Guy Yazzie Teller, who actually saw one of the cliffs collapsing and buried, burying a ruin after the jets had flown over. To round the story out, there was an incident told by Alfred V. Kidder, who made his own explorations of Mesa Verde decades later after Weatherill had put it on the map. Kidder writes, Quote, a number of years ago, Jesse Nussbaum and I were exploring cliff dwellings in the west side of Mesa Verde. We saw one that was high up on the canyon wall opposite us and decided to look into it. But it was a terribly hard climb up a sheer wall and across a narrow ledge with a long drop below. But we finally made it with great elation over our discovery and a successful climb. We peered down through an opening in the rocks at our ruin. And right there before our eyes was an upended slab of stone. On it, we read these words, What fools these mortals be, our Weatherhill, unquote. The quote-unquote simple farmer Weatherhill knew his Shakespeare. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter, guys. But I just wanted to show you, again, these people, that they dug up a third people. It's not just Pueblos, okay? Not just Pueblos, but, and not just cliff dwellers, their ancestors, but these ancient people who had these, you know, unusual skulls, these long-headed or dolichocephalous skulls that were naturally occurring, and then the people afterwards emulating that with the artificial brachycephalus type, okay, found right here in Colorado by Mesa Verde, okay, and other peoples of other morphologies found at Galena, Okay, at Love Lock Key, where they totally destroyed the artifacts there, so it's hard to make sense out of anything. Okay, and even Hovenweep is very questionable about what went on there and the history that they're given there. Okay, so in any case, guys, I just wanted to go over this again because I didn't really like my original video that I did on it on um, Elongated Skulls USA. So I just updated a bit when reading this short chapter from C.W. Saram again. Saram wanted to showcase and highlight some of these people who were ignored, marginalized, you know, the people who really found these things. And it's unfair criticism against Saram, you know, that he's doing this. I mean, you know, should only mainstream, you know, contemporary archaeologists get all the credit? These were the people who found these things. For however amateurish they were, they do do excellent work in some respects. So, in any case, guys, I just want to go over that again, all right? All right, guys, till the next video, Budcat7 signing out. If you like the video, please hit the like button, and peace, my people. Bye now.